This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources. Consistent with its running right process, Alpha is an energy company committed to being a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. We fuel progress around the world. More information at alphanr.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at vachamber.com. Virginia hospitals and health systems provide jobs. They support our economy and promote public health. Local hospitals are always open to help people with unexpected health needs. Having a stable healthcare network is vital. Virginia hospitals are our lifeline. It's amazing what my students with special needs can accomplish. Their pride is priceless. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. week in Richmond and a very special welcome back to Senator Walter Stosh. Appreciate very much your being on this week in Richmond and particularly as as your closing months of serving in the Senate that we can talk about about matters. Folks here in, in Central Virginia know you well and know that you were elected to the House of Delegates in 1982 and served there from 83 to 91 when you were elected to the Senate been in the Senate ever since, and if they check seniority, not your age, but your rank among the 40 senators that you, you rank as third in seniority, and, and the most senior Republican out of the 21 Republicans in the Senate. So with that uh, wealth of time that you've served, we look forward to the con conversation. Let me also say at the beginning that, that prior to your time of service in the General Assembly, you were serving your country, that you were in the Army, and you, you served there, and then came out, went to University of Richmond and with a bachelor's and then a master's degree in, in accounting. And then along the way, you, you uh, were talked into uh, running for the House of Delegates. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting me. I did have the uh, opportunity to respond to a call from Governor Dalton, who visited with me one evening at an event that I was present. He says, uh, you really need to run for the House of Delegates. And I think my response was, well, why would I want to do that? I have a good business. <laughs> right. I've finally gotten to a point where I can enjoy life a little bit. My children are almost grown. They've had a wonderful public school education in, in Virginia. Looking forward to a public college experience in Virginia. Life is good. And his response was something like, that's why you need to give back. Uh -huh. So there's a certain amount of, uh, of uh, calling that said something to the effect that all of us have that duty. We, Once we've achieved a level of success, whether it be personal, financial, or professional, or family, then maybe we do have a responsibility to give back. So that was how I got involved. Now, I did only commit to two years. One that term. Was, that was 33 term. years ago. Yeah, right. You know, we're going to have your website up, up the, on the screen. I'm going to encourage people to go, and they'll learn a great deal more than they will learn in just this short time we have together. Mm. But what they'll see right up the front that you've talked about, that there's a time, a time for everything. Right. So you've, you've determined that this is the time you decided in 82 that it was the time to offer yourself to run. Now you've decided in 2015 that it's time to retire from this service. 
Well, everything has to come to some logical end, and in the legislative process, you try to do the best you can, try to give as much as you're capable of giving, and achieve as much as you feel like you're capable of achieving, and then you have to stand back and say, I'll help someone else take the next step. So that's where I am. I did, did not want to stay here so long that I couldn't be uh, effective. So I just chose now to retire as, after 33 years, and I'll do all that I can to help my successor. On your website, uh, I really appreciate and it, and it says a great deal about the, the person you are and the service that you provided in the Senate that where you said that you're not, I'm not interested in being a state senator. Uh, I want to serve as your senator. I think I may be paraphrasing right. it, but it's not right. just in, not the interest in being, but the interest in actually serving. And I think that the people of your Senate district know that and appreciate the, the time that you've served. Uh, I, I will openly, gladly disclose to our viewers that you're my senator <laughs> and that I've, I've enjoyed the time that you have, you've represented our uh, Senate district. Well, it's certainly been a pleasure and an opportunity. The, the state Senate, as is true of the House of Delegates, are marvelous organizations bringing together people of such diverse backgrounds. But I think this, the focus is all the same, and that is trying to make Virginia the best that it can be using the legislative process, which is a policy-making process, to try to make sure our communities are safe, our children have every opportunity that we can provide in terms of secondary education as well as post-secondary. And those who need care, who cannot care for themselves, particularly the elderly and disabled, uh, have have advocates. All of those are matters that I believe each of our members take seriously. I certainly have, and that's why I use the term serving rather than being. You came into the House of Delegates, uh, Senator Stasha, at a somewhat historic time. It was just a year after the Justice Department had said, we've got to be single member districts, one person, one vote. So you, you came in as you made your two-year commitment to, to serve one term, right at a time when the greater Richmond area in Rico County, where you live and all, uh, where the General Assembly expanded from 60-some districts to, to 100 right. districts at that time. So uh, you were, I guess you might have been the first person serving from that particular house district. Well, people may have forgotten, but prior to that, Henrico had a an eight-person campaign for five seats. We the members of the House of Delegates served at large. So they did not serve any discrete area. They served the, the entire area and, and did so together. Justice Department, in effect, required that each House district be distinct, just like the Senate districts are. So I guess I got caught up in that first one-year term that we've not repeated since, but I served one term that way and then had to run for re-election again and ever since then I've had a a discrete area that I've represented but by and large it's been neither in Henrico or in the Senate most of Henrico. In, in the Senate now you were Senate Majority Leader then Chair of Senate Finance, Co-Chair of Senate Finance along with Senator Colgan and President Pro Tem of the Senate uh, re reflect some on those those important mm -hmm. leadership positions, and, and let me remind all of our viewers that in your work in Senate Finance, that you are the only member of the Senate who's a CPA. That's correct. And so it's, we've had someone who who understands accounting, uh, who serves as well as those who who staff the committees who would understand, but. You've been in those leadership positions now for about a decade, one or more of them. Most of the committees uh, try to identify members in several different ways. First of all, geographically, we try within reason to have every area of the state represented on committees such as the Senate Finance Committee. Then there's respect for your background and experience, but the
Most of the climbing through the ranks occurs by simply longevity. So I had the benefit of, of being available at the right time on the finance committee and having the right background. So I may have entered that role a little earlier, but over time I, I have had the pleasure of being chairman and have res primary responsibility for the major bill, which is the budget bill every year. In the other committees, similarly, I, I chaired the General Laws Committee, which became General Laws and Technology, which was an area of interest I had. And we dealt with Veterans Affairs, which has been another interest of mine. So through the budget, I've been able to fulfill my interests in making sure that uh, education is available and affordable, particularly higher education, so that all of our young people have the same opportunity that we had and to achieve a, an education beyond high school. And the Veterans Affairs were matters that I've spent a lot of time on as well. So uh, I think I've been able to achieve most of what I wanted to achieve or am capable oh, of achieving through that process. Now, the governor is in process. We're having a conversation here in October. Uh, has been in process, I'm sure, of putting together a biennial budget. And you'll be sitting there with your co-chair and with the chairs of the other money committees in December when the governor uh, presents his budget. In that time between the governor presents it and the time that you leave office, uh, is, is that a time that you'd, you and the committees would be doing some review and some work on the budget? We know that actual budget amendments will occur once the new 2016 session convenes and you've started your retirement, but you're, you're there just as a biennial budget is being presented in December and you'll have some ideas on it. Will you have an opportunity to express some of those? Well, leading up to the budget, which is introduced in December, are a number of um, important actions. First of all, our finance committee and all of its subcommittees are active throughout the year gathering information, meeting with agencies, um, learning more about particular facets of the budget. And then Governor McAuliffe has also extended the courtesy to the, at least the chairs of the committees to provide advice in terms of directions, issues that we think are particularly important. So we have that process. And then he will ask his agency heads to provide their financial plan and then make some final decisions and all of that will be introduced in December. So that will become the budget that the General Assembly begins with. And I say begin with because then, then the other members who are perhaps not members of the money committees can have their opportunity to propose amendments or express their views uh, uh, throughout the legislative process. Over the, over the years have you uh, how have you experienced these 60-day sessions that are budget sessions or 46 in the short session? Um, part of the citizen legislature, as you would uh, look in the Stosh crystal ball, do you think the citizen legislature model uh, works well enough that it will continue here in the Commonwealth for the next generation or more? It works well. You know, I think there is a uh, saying that work will expand to meet the amount of time available. So in the short session, we perhaps work a little faster, a little more, a little longer days. But we end up in the long session, the 60-day session, adopting the entire two-year budget. In the short session, we're just modifying that two-year budget. So it all fits together well. I think there's a, there's a lot of activism that takes place among some citizens who, who help us understand their needs and concerns. If I have a disappointment, it is not enough involvement, not enough people understand the process or, or take an interest in what's done so that they can help us make those decisions. A citizen legislature should be driven by the citizens rather than smaller collected groups. But it, I, I'm quite happy with the process. I wouldn't change any part of it if I could. 
and uh, I think it gives all of us an opportunity to represent our 200,000 constituents uh, with uh, a good deal of information that the process produces. It's, it seems rather natural as I reflect on it being CPA that, that you took the lead in some of the tax reforms that have taken place and among those was uh, the income tax issue with Social Security, uh, tax on savings for college plans. Uh, t tell our viewers who may not, who, many of whom who appreciate what you've done but may not know about the history of those changes being made. Well, well before I had all this uh, light-colored hair, <laughs> I took an interest in the elderly and how they were taxed, and I've discovered that their Social Security benefits were taxed in Virginia. State retirement benefits were not, federal retirement benefits were not, and many of our elderly citizens, the only retirement they had was Social Security. So I introduced a, an amendment to a particular bill that prevented or excluded Social Security benefits from being taxed at all in Virginia, and that's been the law of the land since 1995. So it's hard to remember if you if right. you're not drawing Social Security back in those days, but that's a significant item. It's uh, one that, that's embedded in fairness, I think, to our elderly citizens. In terms of other tax matters, uh, we've done away with what we used to call the death tax, which was another name for the estate tax. We've lowered the tax rates for particularly middle income and lower income citizens. We have provided tax incentives for businesses that wanted to hire employees and to encourage jobs, to encourage expansion. Uh, while we are heavily dependent on federal contractors, and federal employees in Northern Virginia, much of our economic activity occurs because of small business. So we try to pay a lot of attention to what makes it easier for small businesses to hire employees. So I would say my accounting background has helped that because I understand the interplay of tax policy with, with what makes business tick and what makes it work, primarily just jobs. I mean, if you think about all the young people Coming out of school today, one of their most pressing needs is how do I take this wonderful education and convert it into a job? From, from your early years growing up in Richmond County and then being in service and then going to college, you've always had an interest, and particularly in the time you've served in the state legislature in, in helping those, whether it's be community college students or helping parents who were saving money for their in, in, in certain plans where they could deduct that from taxes. Uh, those of us here in Central Virginia know about your involvement in creating and expanding the work of a group called GRASP. So with all of that laid out, tell our viewers some about your, your interest in higher ed. And, well, we're all products of our environment. We, we uh, are influenced by who we were and how we grew up, and that's true in my case. I had no hope or expectation of moving beyond high school when I was in high school. In fact, I'm not even sure I expected to graduate from high school. I can't recall. Other than I used to think I got good grades in high school until my children found one of my old report cards <laughs> in the attic one time. Yes. But in any event, not having any opportunity to move beyond that environment, and because the military draft was uh, something that all young men had to do, had to uh, subscribe to, I went into the military and spent three years in the army and discovered a wonderful thing called the GI Bill. And I used that GI Bill as my, uh, my help to get over those financial barriers and attended uh, college using that support. It was only modest. In fact, it was a very small amount, but it was enough to help get over that barrier. So with that experience and with that little extra help, uh, I decided that if I ever had the opportunity, I wanted to help other young people uh, cross over those financial and social barriers. So I created an organization called Great Aspiration Scholarship Program, which has as its purpose to hire and train 
um, highly skilled professionals. They go into public schools. They try to identify young people, just like I was many years ago, and say, look, you can do it, and we'll help you. So they go through that, go through that process. Along the way, I also had the opportunity to introduce uh, legislation that created the Community College Transfer Grant Program, which is very helpful to particularly low-income students, and a relatively unknown but important legislation called the Dual Admission Program, so that students can actually enter into a guaranteed transfer agreement between the community college and the four-year institution and take their first two years at the community college and then seamlessly transfer to the four-year institution. So that's worked very well and uh, also we have a program where young people can earn college credit while they're in high school. We've had last year we had several young people graduate from high school and the two-year community college at the same time because they were advanced students they could take the extra workload. So all of that is part of my effort to help young people get over the financial barriers that prevent them from moving on. And then secondly, providing a framework in which they can have options of community college, four-year college, and depending on their financial resources, they can basically control both the cost and the debt. Uh, you, you said earlier that there's, that the citizen legislature, I went back to that for just a moment, is, is something's working. What what changes have you experienced and seen from your nearly a decade in the House and, and now the time since 1992 in the Senate as you think about what's, what's different now, uh, certainly not saying it's bad, but what's different now than, than what it was um, 20 years ago or 25 years ago? Well, there's certainly been a number of structural changes. I can remember early in my House of Delegates career, I was among the few Republicans in the House of Delegates at the time, and therefore in what you and I would call the minority party. And at that time, there were just a few senior Democrat members who basically controlled the whole process. In fact, Republicans were not allowed to interview judicial candidates, mm. for example. Mm. So there was a heavy partisan emphasis. It actually had the advantage of being very efficient because you had a few older, uh, more senior members of the majority party who basically made all the decisions. That changed over time as more and more people started pressing for more involvement. The party mechanism changed. In the Senate, I've actually been part of the minority party and part of the majority party. And we've tried to be much more inclusive. We've learned from that so that everyone's voice is important. And indeed, when I was major even majority leader in our caucus, I would take the position that my role was to make sure the minority view is heard because the majority view will always prevail. So I think we've become more democratic which brings with it issues like we're seeing in Washington today where people want to have their voice, but it's, it's, it also slows down the process. So I think that's a good change. I'm, I've encouraged that and been a part of that. Um, and there's much more emphasis on, on being prepared and knowledge and take the budget alone, for example, is a huge amount of understanding that most of us didn't really get involved in 20 years ago. We'd go to the chairman of the finance committee and plead our case for something we wanted. And if he liked us, we might get it. If we voted against the budget, we knew we wouldn't get it. So again, the, the process has changed. So it's more inclusive, more democratic, but as a consequence, probably a little more difficult to manage. In our closing 30 seconds, what would you say is the biggest challenge that those who are coming after you, 2016 and beyond, will be facing here in governing Virginia? Continuing to try to reach out to the public, the, the apathy remains so that there are very few people who are involved in the process and uh, they, they tend to be, they're certainly affected by public policy, but they're not always involved to the extent that they 
do the research and get involved with their legislators. So I would hope that more and more of the public would become involved. Senator Stosh, thank you so much for all of your service and thank you for being on This Week in Richmond. Thank you very much. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. Alpha Natural Resources, a leader in mine safety and an environmental steward. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. For jobs, the economy, and public health, Virginia Hospitals, our lifeline. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.